obesity is enormously dangerous. Three in four adults will be either obese or overweight. Americans are not winning their battle against obesity. These clips are from a few decades ago. And if we look at how we're progressing today, the outlook is getting worse. The prevalence of obesity continues to skyrocket with potentially 650 million obese people worldwide. There's no question that ever since the late 70s and early 80s, we've been on this meteoric rise of an obesity epidemic. In fact, there've been recent studies that while more and more people are trying to lose weight, fewer and fewer are actually succeeding in doing it. So why is the world getting fatter despite intervention from the government? And substantially, how do we end this global epidemic? If we look at our bodies like engines, we take in energy through calories. The energy that we don't use through normal movement and exercise is converted into fat storage, preserving the energy and still adhering to the first law of thermodynamics. But if we want to reduce that pesky fat storage, we can simply reduce the amount of energy or calories that we take in on a daily basis and start increasing the flow of calories out of our body through physical activity. Obesity and weight is clearly a combination of energy balance. Well, it's not quite so simple. The problem with the first law is there's a very simple law um, that doesn't quite explain metabolism. And when we talk about metabolism, we're talking about uh, a complex uh, human biologic system involving hormones such as insulin, leptin, ghrelin, PYY. And it's these hormones that determine why we get fat and why we're hungry. The missing parts of the equation are hormones, which your body uses to manage each of its processes. Unfortunately, today, most medical opinions on obesity and its causes are rooted in this controversial calories in, calories out equation. However, if we look at studies like the Women's Health Initiative, we see a different picture emerge. In this study, almost 50,000 women reported that they diligently reduced around 350 calories per day from their diet for about seven years in order to see if there was a noticeable effect on overall weight. The result? Well, it turns out at the end of seven years, they actually didn't lose any weight at all. So if we can't solve obesity by simply counting calories, eating less and running more, what do we do? We need to understand the cause of the disease itself. Let's delve into the different kinds of calories and how they affect our metabolism. There is a fundamental difference between carbohydrate-based calories versus other nutrients. Carb-based calories, like those from starchy and sugary foods, don't stimulate your satiety hormones to make you feel full. It's a very different story when you eat other nutrients. When you eat that piece of steak, what's gonna happen is that your body is gonna start releasing these satiety hormones, which tells you that you're full. Also, when we dig deeper into nutritional science, we find that protein triggers minimal increases in glucose and insulin, while fat in isolation doesn't trigger them at all. Meanwhile, carbohydrates cause a clear spike, which can eventually lead to significant health problems. So what regulates the growth of fat tissue? Well, fundamentally, it's the hormone insulin. And if we're secreting too much insulin, then we're storing calories as fat. The insulin's locking away. It's suppressing fatty acid oxidation in the lean tissue. And the net result is you get fatter. One way to reduce insulin is by eliminating the carbs. Well, you might be more familiar with low carb as a diet fat, but carbohydrate restriction dates back to 1797 when it was first applied to diabetes patients by UK surgeon, Dr. John Rollo. By 1825, French lawyer, politician, and foodie Jean Briès Savarin was recommending cutting out flowers and starches to avoid obesity in his book, The Physiology of Taste. But what about the mainstream medical opinion that while low carb can help you lose weight in the short term, it could have harmful effects on your health? What do these doctors find when they treat patients with low carb? Come on back, Joanne. Okay. All right. We monitored the patients, and much to my surprise, their cardiometabolic markers improved. Things such as lipids, their cardiac CRP, they lost weight, they felt great. Low-carb diet is actually a medical therapy for lots of these conditions that I would treat as an internist, as an internal medicine specialist with medication. 
After understanding low carb as an effective dietary intervention, let's explore the practicalities. If your goal is to lose weight, consider avoiding sugars and starches like those found in bread, pasta, and potatoes. And remember, on a low carb diet, fat, either fat that you eat or your own body fat, is critically important since it will be the main fuel for your body. Eat enough protein to meet your goals and add enough fat to add taste and keep you full. An effective low carb diet for weight loss should always be based on real whole foods. That fits into what we're talking about, which is you gotta get the sugar down, you gotta get the insulin down. Cutting the sugar and the carbs, that's the goal with starting a low carb diet. But people might not see the need to also increase their fat intake for dietary energy. They might even fear fat, thinking it's going to raise their cholesterol and make them fat. Get off the fat side. Get it off. Thanks to our modern science, it's been convincingly shown that the old fear of fat was a mistake. Now, people may need encouragement and reassurance that they can safely use fats without the fear of getting fat. Further evidence, we've now done some head-to-head -head studies comparing traditional low-fat diets to low-carb, high-fat diets. And in virtually all of these studies, they demonstrate that patients have a greater and sustained weight loss on low-carb, high-fat diets. It seems so easy. Couldn't all those low-carb promises be too good to be true? What about the claim that low-carb isn't sustainable? Won't that weight just come creeping back in most cases? Six weeks to two months when people are really sticking to the low-carb diet, while they're in what's called the induction phase, their weight is plummeting. Then they start adding the carbs back and they start plateauing and then their weight starts creeping up again. And so maybe for some people, complete abstinence is better. The hope is that thanks to modern advances in our understanding of nutrition, hormones, and their contributions to our health, we can start reducing the cases of obesity. Now what we see is by giving different lifestyle advice than we have been for the past 50 years, by giving lifestyle advice that patients enjoy with good dietary advice and appropriate guidance, that's one of the best paths to reducing this obesity epidemic. It's important to remember, low carb isn't just a short-term health intervention, it's a lifestyle change. At Diet Doctor, we're here to help people along that journey with the latest knowledge on low carb and keto diets, always based on scientific evidence. If you're ready to learn more about how you can begin a healthy long-term program for weight loss, sign up for the course, Weight Loss for Good. You'll get access to the best advice, tips, and tricks that are scientifically proven to help you lose weight and keep it off for good.